And uh, now on stage, we will host uh, uh, Matt McLarty, uh, who will actually continue the discussion where it started and will present about uh, how we can think the value exchange uh, in the open banking. And hi, Matt, how are you? Good, Matty. How's it going? <laughs> doing well, doing well. I love your mirror, right? You did it on purpose, right? I don't know, but it's it's really beautiful uh, uh, there. Uh, yeah, I I propose that you share your screen, and uh, okay. and we go uh, and we go uh, for twenty five minutes. Yes, it will be a spiritual presentation here. <laughs> yeah, very spiritual. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, Hoping everyone can see the slides. Yeah. Thanks. We, Actually, it's a, it's this is. So thank you to Mehdi and team for organizing this and actually placing me right after Barrett's awesome presentation, who went no slides, like full marks there. Uh, that's uh, that's brave and, and was was very engaging in doing that. I, I'll be using slides, so apologies up front, but there's a lot of visuals here. But it's a, it's a perfect juxtaposition because as Barrett was going into a lot of the details of the industry changes, dynamics, uh, you know, really looking at, 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 at uh, the financial services digital transformation from a lot of different angles. I'm going to attempt to kind of teach a technique that can be used to help deconstruct business models for financial services and reassemble them in, in an API context around open banking. And we heard the discussion or a lot of talk about ecosystems, ecosystems. And that's really where I want to start. So uh, I'll, I'll build to the different concepts in here, but I'm actually going to start a little bit outside of banking and just talk generally about API ecosystems because we hear this term a lot, right? We uh, we hear that uh, you know you have to build an ecosystem or you have to consider the ecosystem, and and having been in the API space for a decade or more, uh, it's it's been a term that we've been using a lot, and so I like to define that. And, and and I mean it really boils down to this: if you have APIs that you're providing to the outside world, right? You need to think about who's ultimately receiving the value provided by your API. And that's probably some group of customers, end users, the, the people who are gaining the ultimate value proposition of your API products, and probably uh, also the ones driving the revenue for your API products. But of course, they're not directly using the API. There's probably some application or device or endpoint that they're using in an experiential way that is actually calling back to the API. And of course, that application or device is has developers who are building it so they have a relationship with your api and they're using tools which could be provided by you could be provided by others and they're using the api and so you need to have support teams developer relations teams you're supporting your api through all these underlying assets and maybe you've got partners in the picture and third-party apis so i think this is a a fairly useful definition to consider when you're just generally offering api products and the reason it's important is because you're not going to get value if you're not getting consumption of your API. And I find that when I'm working with a lot of organizations who are maybe more internally focused around integration needs and so on, you know, they, they can tend to be a little too product focused or too provider side, supply side focused. When to drive value APIs, you really need to be thinking about the consumption, which comes really in the context of this ecosystem. There's other ecosystem views, though, and I think this is this is where there's a really good analogy to open banking. Um, if we consider a case where you've got, uh, let's say, an, a smart speaker, where you want to offer a ride or, or order a ride share, like there's a bunch of API calls that happen in that sequence. You're going to call into a private API that's going to provide have these smart backend services through AWS. That's going to make a call into Lyft or Uber, whoever your ride share is. And then you're going to interact with that Lyft service through either your mobile phone or if you're the driver through your through your uh, vehicle uh, interface. And ultimately, Lyft is also making a bunch of calls back to Google Maps, Stripe, Twilio, and even into Amazon to provision their infrastructure. So if you want to think about the power of ecosystems on a more macro level, on an external level, think about these rideshare companies that have gone from nothing to these massive billion dollar valuations in less than a decade, right? They, that was built on the API economy and is really powering these other aspects of the API economy. So when we think about open banking, right? As services are opened up in, in the financial world, we will get to this point where not only will you need to consider the ecosystem for your individual API products, 
you need to think about how your bank, your financial services organization, or your non-bank, your TPP that's that's wants to play in the financial services space, how it fits into this ecosystem. So I think the best way to approach this is really think about um, business models, because what's going to make you successful, what's going to make or break your success in open banking or any digital ecosystem is what is your business model and what is your business model relative to the overall ecosystem that you're in? Because we've seen cases where in digital ecosystems, you might get what I would call an invasive species that comes in and maybe is, is wildly successful for a short period of time. But if they overly disrupt the overall ecosystem and kill the ecosystem, then they kind of kill their own species as well. Um, you know, an early example of that would be Napster, which came in and, and it just massively disrupted the music industry and then itself died out because it didn't really have a business model that was effective to function that was able to help feed the ecosystem. Now, obviously, the music industry has been built up since then and we've got, uh, well, a, a, a more healthy uh, ecosystem than what was in place. But you can see where, you know, the 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 health of any one ecosystem member is going to depend on the health of all the members of the ecosystem. So if business models are the focus and we're talking about APIs, the good news is that API business models have been studied for quite a while, right? There's um, John Musser, who was the founder of Programmable Web. Um, he had a presentation in 2013 that I think is still the benchmark really called 20, 20 models in 20 minutes or he went through uh, all these different examples of successful API business models, anywhere from free with Facebook to uh, where cases where a developer or consumer is paying for access to an API, to affiliate models where consumers are being paid because they're helping increase distribution of APIs, and then a number of different indirect models that aren't necessarily involved in the exchange of money. And this is a great way to segment the market because I think a lot of people coming into business models are thinking monetization first. And so that, you know, that's been the standard for a while and, and we can even go and kind of apply it to this model where you've got a couple of cases where the consumer is paying. So Lyft is paying AWS for infrastructure service and Lyft is paying Google Maps for the use of their geolocation services because Lyft is the ultimate beneficiary of that value. But Lyft themselves are not going to charge AWS for the ride request API because it's actually value that's realized by Lyft's end customers who are the, the riders themselves who are going to pay once they've done executed the ride. Right? So you can see this idea of you know, the value versus, versus money movement. Um, and, and really what, what is the relationship between the players and the ecosystem. And of course, there's a couple of indirect internal APIs that are in the picture as well. But you know, stepping back from just thinking about monetization, I think that in the digital space, there's definitely a lot more going on than money. And Alex Osterwalder is the creator of the business model canvas, uh, also the value proposition canvas, uh, but he, you know, in his definition of a business model, it's not about money, it's about value. And it's about how an organization can create value, deliver value, and capture value. And those verbs are as important as the notion of value because you can think about it in an ecosystem context, uh, value creation in a vacuum isn't helpful. It has to be delivered and it has to be captured in order to make the whole thing function. So. You know, in studying the, the business model space in APIs, I really wanted to go, you know, step out of the whole, you know, what's been done before, uh, as useful as it is, because I think there's an, there's an essence to the structure of ecosystems that can be captured uh, if we look at that concept of value. And it's no surprise that I ended up at Clayton Christensen's work, who's been so influential on, I think, e-commerce in general, uh, in his work in the Innovator's Dilemma, Innovator Solution, and all the work he did in the Clayton Christensen Institute to help people study innovation. So one of the fundamental concepts in the Innovator's Dilemma is this notion of a value network. And a value network is 
as he defines it in his words, like the collection of upstream suppliers, downstream channels, and providers that come together to support a common business model within an industry. And you can even segment it further within a particular customer. You know, you can bound these value networks by customer. And if you look at the definition of value network from Christensen, it's almost bang on to what we think about when we talk about API ecosystems or digital ecosystems in general. And so how would you map a value network, right? What would you do to actually look at the relationships between these entities in a value network? Well, this, I, I was reading a book by Melissa Perry, great product management book called Escaping the Build Trap. And she starts the book off by just saying, hey, look, when you're in the, in the business of offering products and services, it's all about the value exchange. Your customers have problems, wants, and needs that your products and services fulfill. And in exchange, they're going to give you money. But this value exchange concept can actually be extrapolated and overlaid on the value network to come up with a map that shows you all the different relationships. And, and I actually happened upon the work of these two gentlemen in the Netherlands. They have a, a company called the Value Engineers, although they both are still quite active as professors in academic circles. For years, they've been studying e-commerce business models through the concept of value exchange and have come up with a methodology for mapping out these digital ecosystems, these value networks by using this concept of value exchange. And this is what I'm gonna show in the context of open banking, because what happens is, just to give you an example of a value exchange, here's, a, here's how we might map out an old newspaper print media business model. The newspaper is providing content to readers in exchange for money. They're providing ad space to product companies in return for money. And they're also maybe paying freelance journalists to provide some of their content in addition to the content they provide themselves. Something we consider value creation. What's interesting about this value uh, exchange mapping approach is you can start to see patterns evolve. And if we look at what Facebook would look like as a business model, we can see parties that are very similar. Instead of readers, we have users and they want content. However, they're not paying for it. Not necessarily, they might pay for some, some games, but in general, they're paying with their data. They're paying with personal information, with relationship information. They're providing content themselves. And in exchange for that, they're getting the content, they're getting the engagement. On the other side, product companies who want advertising space, they're generating something like 98% of Facebook's revenue. And the reason Facebook can collect so much advertising money is because they have monetized all that data and relationship information from their users that they can go back and use for targeting so that they can provide precise measurable advertising that a print media company could never do. So you can see why media companies are under such threat now. But the main point here is we can see in these examples that there's a pattern of a business model that's evident in the map, the topology of the ecosystem that can be applied in a new digital context. So when it comes to APIs, we've got um, generally going back to that API ecosystem idea, value exchange wise, we can think about the provider of an API, the consumer of an API, and then the end user who may be realizing the ultimate value provided by that API. So we usually have this indirect relationship. But when it comes to API specifically, I think they are digital enablers of value exchange. And it's not just money that's currency here. It's, there's lots of different things that can be exchanged. Yes, you can have money. Yes, you can have products and services. But we've already seen in the Facebook example, the power of data and how that can be monetized. Exposure and reach, something that we can um, we can see as being valuable because um, Facebook's reach of those, those users is something that they've monetized back to the advertising companies. And this notion of time. You could even add on trust and security as things that are exchanged in the digital ecosystem because if you're a trusted provider, you're more likely to attract engagement and especially long-term engagement. So let's, let's show some examples of this in the API economy of how it would look. First of all, you know, I talked about the importance of patterns. And because of time limits here, I might give a little more history on this, but let's just say studying the API economy uh, based on these business models, there's a pattern here that I call manufacturer supplier pattern where 
you've got an API provider that's just going to provide a piece of an ultimate product that's being built for end users. So this is a case where Google Maps API is, is a great example. So Google Maps provides very unique data, best of breed functionality for geolocation services. And so it can be used by all sorts of different digital products, whether it's the Lyft example we saw or um, you know, any, you know, pretty much any app that's using geolocation services, they can build in the Google Maps API as uh, the same way that an auto manufacturer might use some parts from a parts supplier, right? They're de delivering value to the, to the consumer directly. So the consumer is saying, yes, I'll, I'll pay you money to use that service. What's interesting, I think, specifically about the Google Maps uh, case is that the consumers are not only providing money for the service. They're also providing data, which Google is then using to profile and cor correlate with users and feed into their own uh, advertising value creation and targeting. But that's, that's probably a higher order story. But we can see this pattern in the open banking world as well in a couple of ways. Number one, in places where you've seen regulation take place, like uh, in, in the European banking market, you've got this concept of third party providers engaging with banks. Banks have been regulated to provide account info and payment initiation services. You've got third party providers like Yolt who are coming in and taking all that information and providing end-to-end -end financial processes. In the case of Yolt, I think they're taking in people's aggregated account information and giving you planning tools, ways that you can you know, plan out your spend, analyze your financial activity. This is actually a business model that's been in place for a while with companies like Yodely and, and Intuit as well. But this is a pattern that we can see take hold in the open banking space. And as a bank, I think you should be considering you know, what is going to be the impact on my value exchange with my end customers? Because those end users in this model are also customers of the bank. So what? how is that going to impact the value exchanges you have with customers? Another example would be actually flip it around. And what if the bank is the manufacturer using unique products and services from fintechs? Uh, and an example here is Starling Bank, who's built a marketplace where they're actually taking in building a marketplace of fintech providers that they're then providing out to their customers. So again, taking this manufacturer supplier approach. A really interesting pattern that we've observed is this API retailer business model. And in the retailer business model, um, this is where you know, Twilio is the ultimate example here. What does Twilio do? Well, they take in all these telco carrier services, SMS and voice over IP and, and billing and so on, and package them up and target them at developers. And there's a very big API flavor here because the value proposition Twilio has is they're giving time to market benefits to their consumers by um, providing reach and, and providing an aggregated set of services, as well as providing usability benefit by having very easy to use, very targeted APIs. So the design element is part of their value creation that they then exchange with all these mobile and web app providers. And we can see this in the banking world too. Plaid is a company that was just acquired by Visa for $5.3 billion. What do they do? Well, they started out, they were gonna be doing something like uh, Yolt and other companies where they were gonna have an app to help people aggregate their account information. But they recognized that a lot of the hard work was just in connecting to backend banking information. So what they've done is they've created a platform so that other fintechs, other third party providers, anyone really can come in and access account information and they're providing the usability through APIs that they're you know, in this, what I would call a retailer model, just like they're the retailer, the banks are the wholesalers. So again, you know, if they're able to create that much value, it's a question back to the banks is what's the, the role that can be played there. The final business model pattern I'll talk about is just the aggregator business model. And this is a business model pattern that's kind of a general business model uh, that's well known in the digital space. Companies like Uber and, and really any, any sort of two-sided marketplace follow this. I've got Airbnb here as an example. What are they doing? Well, by, by providing scale of bringing on multiple uh, property owners and renters together they're able to say to the renters, hey, we've got a wide variety of 
properties for rent. We have trusted services for payment. We have recommendations, which will help build trust as well that, that we're providing good properties. So these all these kind of scale benefits of, of the marketplace. Um, and this is evident in a few different cases. In, in, in the banking space, you have service aggregators like TransferWise. So what are they, what is TransferWise aggregating? They're really aggregating all the different ways that you can pay people using banks as the intermediaries to say, you know, we can pay by this card mechanism or through this account mechanism. Um, and they've actually been more aggressive with their API approach to start providing open APIs so that third party businesses can use their services, kind of white label their transfer services for any case where somebody needs to make payments, they can outsource that functionality to TransferWise through their API. Another aggregator business model is in the banking space is what I see in the mortgage space where there's the mortgage uh, business is in a lot about brokering um, and we're starting to see online broker companies. There's one here in Canada where I'm like, located called IntelliMortgage where they're actually um, sort of hiding the providers and the mortgages behind the scenes and focusing on a very high usability experience for customers where you would just give your, your inputs around term of mortgage and you know some other attributes about what you're looking for. And they're actually using third party sources to, to provide you with the, with the product offerings. So the main point, I know it's been a very quick run through this approach, but the main point here is that if we can look at this notion of value exchange, it can really help us map out um, what the, what the uh, business model opportunities are in open banking. If you take this ecosystem approach and you understand the dynamics of how your business is gonna operate relative to all the different touch points, it's gonna give you a, a good idea of what your success is gonna be. So point number one is definitely define a business model, make sure that's a big part of what you're focused on. Um, use this mechanism to identify what your business model is realistically, what it could be, what are the other fine tuning you could make to even grow. You know, as you get comfortable, you can start to you know, get into a flywheel of continuous improvement around the business model. Think about what the patterns are, look at other industries, look at what's been sex successful in the API economy for ideas, how it can be applied to open banking, and really always keep that ecosystem mindset. So because I had to rush through, there's a lot more in, the, in these resources here that will be shared in the slides. Uh, there's a lot more that will be coming. Um, and we've got, as MuleSoft, we have workshops where we can help you dive very deeply into these concepts especially around this, what we call our API as a product workshop, where we can help you think through all product dimensions of, of, uh, of your API business strategy. But for that, I don't know if I have any time uh, left for questions, but I'm happy to take them if we do. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, maybe just one question about uh, the value, uh, value exchange. Uh, uh, so some, some companies do APIs to reduce costs for others, like cost of integration, like Plaid. Some companies do APIs to enable more business for others, collecting more payments, reaching more people, right? So increase revenues. Do you see any model that may work more than the other? Or, uh, or, or do you have any opinion on, on, on that? I think, no, I think it's, I think actually going through this exercise would help there because, you know, I've got a whole workshop around this and we go through three different areas of opportunity. One of them is identifying new channels and customer segments that you would put through the kind of the revenue generating partner opportunities. Another is to look at individual value exchanges and think about what other value could be exchanged in that connection. And the third one is looking at optimizing the supply side. So I think there's, there's op opportunities throughout. I think, I think the big challenge for a lot of banks is that they've been operating in closed ecosystems, at least from the customer touch point perspective, like banks are reliant on a lot of third party partners for various things. But to be able to step out and think about things from their customer perspective, uh, I think any of those opportunities can can bear fruit. But it's a matter of being very intentional about, about what you're going after and not just assuming that, well, hey, everyone else is doing this, so maybe we should try that, right? Always have a goal in mind. And, and by focusing on value exchange, I think it helps to 
to keep things very focused. Yeah, focus on value exchange. Don't focus on on uh, on competitors, <laughs> at least competitors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Matt. All right. Thank you Thanks. for uh, this talk. A really nice picture uh, for everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and we will. Uh, we'll